Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 11 of Open Secrets here on Grand Fork's Best Source. This is part two of The Creature from Jekyll Island, a continuation of last week's episode, of course. Last week, we talked about the financial system and how it works, essentially how it operates to enslave a large part of humanity. We here in the United States have the good slavery where it's filled with all these wonderful pleasures, but slowly but surely over generations, inflation has robbed us of a tremendous amount of our wealth. In this episode, we will be getting into a lot of history. In fact, it's all history. It is history of the international financiers, how they rose to power. Uh, it is a history of the wars of World War I, World War II, the, a true history. None of this, well, virtually none of this stuff that you're going to hear in this episode was taught to us in our education systems at any level. It is nonetheless vital to understand. Of course, if we don't understand history, we have no uh, platform to understand what is happening here in the present. So without further ado, we will jump right into this. And again, I encourage you all to please go watch episode or part one of The Creature from Jekyll Island if you uh, missed it, because there's a lot of important information there. Um, I'm going to start with just showing a lot of pictures here. There's a, there's um, quite a few pictures in this book, actually, and it is photographs of some of the characters that we talked about last episode, as well as we'll be talking about in this episode. And here we see Cecil Rhodes. I won't go into detail here because, we'll, again, we will be talking about them. We have Cecil Rhodes. We have August Belmont, who was the Rothschild agent in the United States of America in the pre-Civil War era. We have J.P. Morgan Sr., uh, John D. Rockefeller. Here's the uh, clubhouse on Jekyll Island where the Federal Reserve Act was brainstormed and brought into fruition. Jacob Schiff, a, another international financier of the Jewish persuasion who helped greatly fund the Federal Reserve process, uh, bringing about the Federal Reserve, uh, as well as the Bolshevik Revolution. Here's a very interesting cartoon that was created by one of the minor characters, and it's kind of funny because his name's Robert Minor, but one of the minor characters in our story today, showing Karl Marx and all these international financiers, um, the, uh, Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Perkins of the Morgan Trust, as well as Teddy Roosevelt is on here, and he at the time was the head of the, pres uh, the Progressive Party, but they're all shaking hands with Karl Marx because they love these ideals of socialism. Guys, we talked about last week, Harry Dexter White, or I guess it was two weeks ago, last episode, Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes, who were influential, most influential minds at the Bretton Woods meeting, which produced the IMF and the World Bank. You have Raymond Robbins here, who we'll be talking about today. Edward Mandel House, we'll get into detail on today as well. And also here's Carol Quigley, who was the historian who wrote... Anglo-American Establishment and Tragedy and Hope will probably one day do, well, hopefully one day we'll do Anglo-American Establishment. Tragedy and Hope would be a probably 10-part episode. It's a massive book. Um, but here's the historian who is revealing a lot of things. Um, here's Winston Churchill, who is certainly not a good guy, as we'll find out today. Um, but Lord Mersey, I don't think we're going to talk about today, but he was kind of in charge of covering up the Lusitania incident, which he called a damn dirty business when he grew a conscience, but again, he already committed incredible acts of treachery. So, if you recall from last episode, um, G. Edward Griffin wrote this book with um, summaries at the end of each chapter. He had large summaries, and again, I'm not one who am I to question G. Edward Griffin, so I will read the summaries, and then when there is details that I would like to read to you. I'll go back into the chapter and we'll read those details. And there are a lot of fascinating details that we're going to get into today. So this first chapter of this second episode of this book is called the Rothschild formula. And this, this first two few chapters here, or at least this first chapter here is obviously going to be heavily about the Rothschilds and the history of the Rothschild, um, how they rose to prominence and 
how they, you know, because they will be a recurring theme throughout the rest of this full story. So, by the end of the 18th century, the House of Rothschild had become one of the most successful financial, financial institutions the world has ever known. The world has ever known. Think about that. The world has ever known. In the history of the world, these are some of the most powerful money people ever. And I think my personal view on this is that the Rothschilds, again, the Rothschilds, again, of the they are Jewish, uh, Jewish family. Um, they are still in power. They, I think, I think again, the power of this magnitude tends to, if if it is not known about, if it is not seen by people, not comprehended, it tends to get more and more powerful. And I have little doubt that they have secured more power since then. But again, at this time, the late eighteenth century, so um, the late seventeen hundreds. They're already one of the greatest financial institutions the world's ever known. Its meteoric rise can be attributed to the great industry and shrewdness of the five brothers who established themselves in various capitals of Europe and forged the world's first international financial network. As pioneers in the practice of lending money to governments, they soon learned that this provided unique opportunities to parlay wealth into political power as well. Before long, most of the princes and kings of Europe had come within their influence. The Rothschilds also had mastered the art of smuggling on a grand scale, often with the tacit approval of the governments whose laws they violated. This was perceived by all parties as an unofficial bonus providing for providing needed funding to those same governments, particularly in time of war. The fact that different branches of the Rothschild network also might be providing funds for the enemy was pragmatically ignored. Thus, a time-honored practice among financiers was born profiting from both sides. The Rothschilds operated a highly efficient intelligence gathering system which provided them with advanced knowledge of important events, knowledge which was invaluable for investment decisions. Of course, if you know, like in, insider trading today, this, this was insider trading already at continental scales. So if you know the outcome of certain things that are greatly going to affect economics, you can massively benefit from them and we'll get into the details of how they did that when an exhausted Rothschild courier delivered the first news of the battle of waterloo nathan was able to deceive the london bond traders into selling into a selling panic and that allowed him to acquire the dominant holding of england's entire debt at but a tiny fraction of its worth so he owned england essentially a study of these similar events reveals a personality profile, not just of the Rothschilds, but of that special breed of international financiers whose success typically is built upon certain character traits. Those include cold objectivity, immunity to patriotism, and indifference to the human condition. Psychopaths. That profile is the basis for proposing a theoretical strategy called the Rothschild formula, which motivates such men to propel governments into war for the profits they yield. This formula likely, most likely has never been consciously phrased as it appears here, but subconscious motivations and personality traits work together to implement it nevertheless. As long as the mechanism of central banking exists, it will be to such men an irresistible temptation to convert debt into perpetual war and war into perpetual debt. In the following chapters, we shall track the distinctive footprint of the Rothschild formula as it leads up to our own doorstep in the present day. All right, let's get into this. <clears throat> the Rothschild Dynasty. The Rothschild dynasty had conquered the world more thoroughly, more cunningly, and more lastingly than all the Caesars before or the Hitlers after them. The dynasty was begun in Frankfurt, Germany in the middle of the 18th century by Mayor Amschel Bauer, the son of a goldsmith. Mayer became a clerk in the Oppenheimer Bank in Hanover and was eventually promoted to junior partner. After his father's death, he returned to his home in Frankfurt to continue the family business. Over the door hung a red shield with an eagle as a sign to identify the establishment. The German words for red shield are Rothschild. So he changed his name from Bauer to Rothschild and added five gold arrows held in the talons of the eagle to represent his five sons. The Rothschild fortune began when Mayer adopted the practice of fractional reserve banking. As we have seen, he was not alone in this. But the House of Rothschild greatly surpassed the com competition. 
This was due to his sharp business acumen and also because of his five most unusual sons, all of whom became financial power centers of their own. As they matured, they learned the magic of converting debt into money. They moved beyond the confines of Frankfurt and established additional operations in the financial centers, not only of Europe, but much of the civilized world. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, the brothers conducted important transactions on behalf of the governments of England, France, Prussia, Austria, Belgium, Spain, Naples, Portugal, Brazil, various German states, and other smaller countries. They were the personal bankers of many of the crowned heads of Europe. They made large investments through agents in markets as distant as the United States, India, Cuba, and Australia. They were financiers to Cecil Rhodes, making it possible for him to establish a monopoly over the diamond fields of South Africa. They are still connected with the De Beers. Biographer Derek Wilson writes, those who lampooned or vilified the Rothschilds for their sinister influence had a considerable amount of justification for their anger and anxiety. The banking community had always constituted a fifth estate whose members were able, by their control of royal purse strings, to affect important events. But the House of Rothschild was immensely more powerful than any financial, financial empire that had ever preceded it. It commanded vast wealth. It was international. It was independent. Royal governments were nervous of it because they could not control it. Popular movements hated it because it was not answerable to the people. Constitutionalists resented it because it influ its influence was exercised behind the scenes, secretly. Secrecy, of course, is essential for the success of a cabal, and the Rothschilds perfected the art. By remaining behind the scenes, they were able to avoid the brunt of public anger, which was directed instead at the political figures which they largely controlled. And right here, power never appears on TV. Even to this day, this is how it operates. There used to be, um, you know, after World War I, even before that, people actually knew who the Rothschilds were. They talked about them openly. They knew that they were a problem. Well, relatively openly. And I, I say a larger percentage of the population were aware of the problem back then than they are now. Now these guys exist. And this, again, it's not just the Rothschild family. There's a lot of families involved in this, but we never talk about them. These are the true elite of the world. Nothing happens on planet earth of any major consequence without their say so nothing. And the puppets you see on television are truly just that they are actors. They are controlled and their corruption is a result of massive financial influence from the Rothschilds. Some people are, you know, controlled through other ways, but that'll be a story for another time. This is a technique which has been practiced by financial manipulators ever since, and it is fully utilized by those who operate the Federal Reserve System today. Wilson continues, Clandesti clandestinity was and remained a feature of Rothschild political activity. Seldom were they to be seen engaging in open public debate on important issues. Never did they seek government office. Even when, in later years, some of them entered Parliament, they did not feature prominently in the assembly chambers of London, Paris, or Berlin. Yet, all the while, they were helping to shape the major events of the day. By granting or withholding funds, by providing statesmen with an official diplomatic service, by influencing appointments to high office, and by an almost daily intercourse with the great decision makers. I think there was one, maybe two Rothschilds who ever held office. Uh, I could be wrong with that, but one of them um, was in the House of Lords in the 1800s. And he, I think he introduced two laws, one of which was about like, milk or something like something weird like that but then the other one i believe was the corn laws which made grain produced in england cheaper than imported grain so that they could force laborers english laborers off of the fields and into the major cities where the where the industrial revolution was happening so they could fill their factories with workers um, who they of course did not care about whatsoever because that is again just incredible incredible manipulation and evil going on there. <clears throat> Sorry here. One of the most fascinating 
and revealing episodes to be recorded by Rothschild biographers concerns the smuggling of a large shipment of gold to finance the Duke of Wellington, who was attempting to feed and equip an army in Portugal and in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. It was not at all certain that Wellington would be able to defeat Napoleon in the coming battle, and the Duke was hard-pressed to convince bankers and merchants in Portugal and Spain to accept his written promises to pay, even though they were officially guaranteed by British by the British government. These notes were deeply discounted, and Wellington was desperate for gold coin. It was at this point that Nathan Rothschild offered the services of himself and his brothers with an efficient smuggling apparatus already functioning throughout Europe. He was able to offer Wellington much better terms while still making a magnificent profit. But to accomplish this, the gold had to pass right under Napoleon's nose. And so, at this time, Napoleon actually knew, was very well and very familiar with the Rothschilds, did not like them, understood that if he went into debt with the Rothschilds, he would be controlled by them, and he did not want to do that at all, of course, because Napoleon wanted to be his own emperor and, you know, probably emperor of the world. So he found a, an alternative method for financing his war efforts, which will, part of which was to sell a little thing called the Louisiana Purchase to the Americans for a handsome sum. It's not that Napoleon was against banking in general. He just wanted to be his own bank. Obviously, that did not sit well with the uh, Rothschild family. Frederick Morton describes the scene. There was only one way to route the cash through the very France, England's army was fighting. Of course, the Rothschild blockade running machine already had superb cogs whirring all over Germany, Scandinavia, and England, even in Spain and southern France. But a very foxy new wheel was needed in Napoleon's capital itself. Enter Jacob, henceforth called James, the youngest of Mayer's sons. James was only 19 years old, but was well trained by his father in the art of deception. He arrived in Paris with a dual mission— First, he was to provide the French authorities with a false report about the British gold movement with just enough truth in it to sound convincing. He presented the government with falsified letters indicating that English were desperate to halt the flow of their gold into France. The ploy paid off when the French authorities then actually encouraged the financial community to accept British gold and to convert it into commercially sound banknotes. Second, James was to serve as a vital link in a financial chain stretching between London and the Pyrenees. He was to coordinate the receipt of the gold into France, the conversion of that gold into Spanish banknotes, and the movement of those notes out of the country on their way to Wellington. All of this he did with amazing dexterity, especially considering his youth. Morton concludes, In the space of a few hundred hours, Mayer's youngest had not only gotten the English gold rolling, into, rolling through France, but conjured a fiscal mirage that took in Napoleon himself. A teenage Rothschild tricked the imperial government into sanctioning the very process that helped to ruin it. The family machine began to hum. Nathan sent big shipments of British guineas, Portuguese gold ounces, French Napoleons to ore, often freshly minted in London, across the channel. From the coast, James saw them to Paris and secretly transmuted the metal into bills on certain Spanish bankers. South of the capital, Kalman, another, another of Mayer's sons, materialized, took over the bills, blurred into a thousand shadowed canyons along the Pyrenees, and reappeared with Wellington's receipts in hand. Solomon, another son, was everywhere, troubleshooting, making sure the transit points were diffuse and obscure enough not to disturb either French delusion or the British guinea rate. Amschel stayed in Frankfurt and helped the father mayor to staff headquarters. The French did catch a few whiffs of the truth, sometimes the su suspicious could be pr prosperously purged of their suspicion. The police chief of Calais, for example, suddenly was able to live in such distracting, lu distracting luxury that he found it difficult to patrol the shoreline thoroughly. While Napoleon struggled his might away in the R Russian winter, there passed through France itself a gold vein to the army staving in the empire's back door. At a dinner party... In later years, Nathan casually summed up the episode as though it were merely a good piece of routine business. He said, The East, East India Company had 800,000 pounds worth of gold to sell. I went to the sale and bought it all. I knew the Duke of Wellington must have it. The government sent for me and said they must have the gold. I sold the gold to them, but they didn't know how to get it to, 
the Duke in Portugal. I undertook all that and sent it through France. It was the best business I have ever done. And now here is the result of this, the Battle of Waterloo. The final outcome of the Battle at Waterloo began between or between Wellington and Napoleon was crucial to Europe, both politically and economically. If Napoleon had been victorious, England would have been in even greater economic trouble than before. Not only would she have lost international power and prestige, but even at home, her subjects would have been further disgruntled over such great personal and financial wartime sacrifices. Her defeat almost surely would have resulted in not being able to repay the great amounts she had borrowed to conduct the war. In the London Stock Exchange, therefore, where British government bonds where British government bonds were traded along with other securities, everyone waited anxiously for the news of the outcome. It was well known that the Rothschilds had developed a private courier service that was used not only to transport gold and other tangible cargo, but to rapidly move information that could be useful in making investment decisions. It was expected, therefore, that Nathan in London would be the first to know the name of the victor after the cannon smoke had cleared from the battlefield, and they were not disappointed. The first news of Wellington's victory arrived in Brussels around midnight on June 18, 1815, where a Rothschild agent named Rothwarn was waiting in readiness. He immediately mounted a fresh horse and set off for the port of Ostend, where a boat was standing to speed him across the channel to London. In the early hours of June 20th, the exhausted messenger was pounding on Nathan's door a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier, Major Henry Percy, arrived. At least one friendly biographer claims that Nathan's first act was to deliver the news to the prime minister, but that government officials were hesitant at first to believe it because it ran contrary to reports they had received previously telling of a serious British of serious British setbacks. At any rate, there is no doubt that Nathan's second act of the morning was to set off for the stock exchange to take up a position at his usual pillar. All eyes were upon him as he slumped dejectedly, staring at the floor. Then he raised his gaze with pained expression, began to sell. The whisper went through the crowd, crowded room. Nathan is selling. Nathan is selling. Wellington must have lost. Our government bonds will never be repaid. Sell them now. Sell. Sell. Prices tumbled, and Nathan sold again. Prices plummeted, and still Nathan sold. Finally, prices collapsed altogether, and in one quick move, Nathan reversed his call and purchased the entire market in government bonds. In a matter of just a few hours, he had acquired the dominant holding of England's entire debt at but a tiny fraction of its worth. So, there you see, again, this is the year 1815. 1815. Very long ago, over two centuries ago, this happened when you had a financer take control of the finances, essentially, of a an ostensibly sovereign nation, then that nation is Britain. And then thus they used the, what was already existent. The, the central bank of, of England was already existent. So, you know, this, but they merged this process. So the, the financial institutions of England became totally enslaved essentially to the hands of a private individual. And I'll just talk here quickly about the, Rothschild formula in a little more detail. It has five parts, according to G. Edward Griffin. Number one, war is the ultimate discipline to any government. If it can successfully meet the challenge of war, it will survive. If it cannot, it will perish. All else is secondary. The sanctity of its laws, the prosperity of its citizens, and the solvency of its treasury will be quickly sacrificed by any government in its primal act of self-survival. And I put here, I think, COVID-19, covid is an evolution of this process. It is the, the, yeah, the next generation manipulation of governments and thus the people of the government. Number two, all that is necessary, therefore, to ensure that a government will maintain or expand its debt is to involve it in war or the threat of war. The greater the threat and the more destructive the war, the greater the need for debt. Number three, to involve a country in war or the threat of war, it will be necessary for it to have enemies with credible military might. If such enemies already exist, all the better. If they exist but lack military strength, it will be necessary to provide them the money to build their war machine. If an enemy does not exist at all, then it will be necessary to create one by financing the rise of a hostile regime. And right here, again, this is the story of Russia and China. The We talked about it last episode. The IMF loans... 
established Russia. Massive amounts of Wall Street financing went into establishing the Soviet Union as a legitimate regime. Not only finances, as we'll get into a little bit later here, but also engineering and um, industry were invested in the USSR, all with Western financing. Same with China. The ultimate goal, and then again, that's who we are fighting or about to fight soon here, it seems, is China and Russia, ostensibly our enemies. Number four, the ultimate obstacle is a government which declines to finance its wars through debt. Although this seldom happens, when it does, it will be necessary to encourage internal political opposition, insurrection, or revolution to replace that government with one that is more compliant to our will. The assassination of heads of state could play an important role in this process. I think we witnessed this in 2011 in Libya when Muammar Gaddafi was ousted by an insurrection of the people, largely propped up by American intelligence so-called, well, supposedly American intelligence forces. And Gaddafi was not a good guy, but he did not want the international elite meddling in the affairs of his nation. Libya was probably the most, or one of, at least one of the most advanced nations in all of Africa. They had wonderful benefits and to truly, if you had children and want to support a family, the government helped you to support your family and made sure they, that you were taken care of and provided you wonderful opportunities to work. So it was a very advanced nation that didn't want to be uh, indebted to the international cabal. And they started an insurrection and he died a very horrible death. Number five, no nation can be allowed to remain militarily stronger than its adversaries for that could lead to peace and a reduction of debt. To accomplish this balance of power, it may be necessary to finance both sides of the conflict. Unless one of the combatants is hostile to our interests and therefore must be destroyed, neither side should be allowed a decisive victory or defeat. While we must always proclaim the virtues of peace, the unspoken objective is perpetual war. How long have we been in the Middle East? Do we have a decisive victory there? Certainly not. Are we, have we been at perpetual war there? There are a great number of people who have never known anything but the United States being at war with the Middle East. Why is that? Because as explained here, we, the United States can't have a decisive victory. We're supposed to be dumping trillions of dollars into the war machine, which we have been, which all goes to waste, essentially. It's a way to impoverish, another mechanism to impoverish our nation and remove it from this, what they talked about in uh, the beginning of this is there can't be one obvious dominant power. Otherwise, you might have peace if that's a peaceful dominant power. Thus, they are d destroying the United States of America, which we talk about at length in past episodes. So there you see the Rothschild formula. There you see the Rothschilds, how they operate, have operated for centuries now, have probably you know, even more power nowadays, I can't imagine. Um, so... Yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on there, a lot to reflect upon and what that means for our present day society. And we kind of talked about that in the last episode, but it is certainly a not good for you and I. It has ushered in a form of financial slavery that we must come together, understand that this is happening, must come together, form solutions, quit hitting each other. Otherwise, we are in for massive problem. This next chapter is called Sink the Lusitania, and it is about how America got involved scandalously. Once again, this is, this is a just history of crimes against humanity, um, how America got involved in World War I. To finance the early stages of World War I, England and France had borrowed heavily from investors in America and had selected the House of Morgan as sales agent for their bonds. Morgan also acted as their U.S. purchasing agent for war materials, thus profiting from both ends of the cash flow, once when the money was borrowed and again when it was spent. Further profits were derived from production contracts placed with companies within the Morgan orbit. But the war began to go badly for the Allies when Germany's submarines took virtual control of the Atlantic shipping lanes. As England and France moved closer to defeat, or a negotiated peace on Germany's terms, it became increasingly difficult to sell their bonds. No bonds meant no purchases, and the Morgan cash flow was threatened. Furthermore, 
If the previously sold bonds should go into default, as they certainly would in the wake of defeat, the Morgan Consortium would suffer gigantic losses. The only way to save the British Empire, to restore the value of the bonds, and to sustain the Morgan cash flow was for the United States government to provide the money. So you have a private bank, J.P. Morgan's, ushering and creating the circumstances for the United States of America to break its isolationism and join a global war. Scandalous. But since neutral nations were prohibited from doing that by treaty, America would have to be brought into the war. A secret ag agreement to that effect was made between British official officials and Colonel House with the concurrence of the president. From that point forward, Wilson began to pressure Congress for a declaration of war. This was done at the very time he was campaigning for re-election on the slogan, he kept us out of the war. All, all politicians have been liars for a very long time. Well, not all, but the vast majority of. Meanwhile, Morgan purchased control over major segments of the news media and engineered a nationwide editorial blitz against Germany, calling for, the, for war as an act of American patriotism. Morgan had created international an international shipping cartel, including Germany's merchant fleet, which maintained a near monopoly on the high seas. Only the British Cunard lines remained aloof. The Lusitania was owned by Cunard and operated in competition with Morgan's cartel. The Lusitania was built to military spe specifications and was registered with the British Admiralty as an armed auxiliary cruiser. She had carried passengers as a cover to conceal her real mission, which was to bring contraband war materials from the United States. This fact was known to the Wilson and, oth and others in his administration, but they did nothing to stop it. When the German embassy tried to publish a warning to the American passengers, the State Department intervened and prevented newspapers from printing it. When the Lusitania left New York Harbor on her final voyage, she was virtually a floating ammunition depot. The British knew that to draw the United States into the war would mean the difference between defeat and victory, and anything that could accomplish that was proper, even the coldly calculated sacrifice of one of her great ships with Englishmen aboard. But the trick was to have Americans on board also in order to create the proper emotional climate in the United States. As the Lusitania moved into hostile waters where a German U-boat was known to be operating, First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, ordered her destroyer protection to abandon her. Thus, this, plus the fact that she had been ordered to travel at reduced speed, and there's actually some other orders that Winston Churchill ordered to, to make sure that this, this ship, the Lusitania, was sunk. So Winston Churchill, evil, evil, evil man. <clears throat> this, plus the fact that she had been ordered to travel at reduced speed, made her an easy target. After the impact of one well-placed torpedo, a mighty second explosion from within ripped her apart, and the ship that many believe could not be sunk gurgled to the bottom in less than 18 minutes. The deed had been done, and it set in motion great waves of revolu revulsion against the Germans. These waves eventually flooded through Washington and swept in the United States into war. Within days of the declaration, Congress voted $1 billion in credit for England and France. $2 million was sent to England immediately and was applied to the Morgan account. $200 million, excuse me, to the Morgan account. The vast quantity of money needed to finance the war was created by the Federal Reserve System, which means it was co collected from Americans through that hidden tax called inflation. Within just five years, this tax had taken fully one half of all they had saved. The infinitely higher cost in American blood was added to the bill and also future American blood because this again broke our isolationism. Thus it was that the separate motives of such diverse personalities as Winston Churchill, J.P. Morgan, Colonel House, and Woodrow Wilson all, all found common cause in bringing America into World War I. Churchill maneuvered for military advantage. Morgan sought the profits of war. House schemed for political power and Wilson dreamed of a chance to dominate a post- War League of Nations. And some of the details I want to get into here involve uh, Colonel Edward Mandel House. It's a very interesting story. One of the most influential men behind the scenes at this time was Colonel Edward Mandel House, personal advisor to Woodrow Wilson and later to FDR. House had close contacts with J.P. Morgan and the old banking families of Europe. He had received several years of his schooling in England and in later years surrounded himself with prominent members of the Fabian Society. We talked about them last week. They are the, uh, 
socialists, who the, well, the individuals push, pushing world socialism, not through violence like the communists were, but through um, propaganda and nudging people slowly into accepting, get mind control, into accepting world socialism. They've been supremely successful at this. Furthermore, he was a man of great personal wealth, most of it acquired during the war between the states. His father, Thomas William House, had acted as the confidential American agent of unknown banking interests in London. It was commonly believed he represented the Rothschilds. Although settled in Houston, Texas, the elder often remarked that he wanted his sons to know and serve England. He was one of the few residents of a Confederate state who emerged from the war with a great fortune. It is widely acknowledged that Colonel House was the man who selected Wilson as a presidential candidate and who secured his nomination. He became Wilson's constant companion, and the president admitted publicly that he depended on him greatly for instruction and guidance. Many of Wilson's important appointive posts in government were hand-selected by House. He and Wilson even went so far as to develop a private code so they could communicate freely over the telephone. The president himself had written, Mr. House is my second personality. He is my independent self. His thoughts and mine are one. George Virick, an admiring biographer of House, tells us, House and the Texas delegation, House had the Texas delegation in his pocket. Always moving quietly in the background, he made and unmade several governors of Texas. House selected Wilson because he regarded him as the best available candidate. For seven long years, Colonel House was Woodrow Wilson's other self. For six long years, he shared with him all but the title of Chief Magistry of the Republic. For six years, two rooms were at his disposal in the north wing of the White House. It was House who made the, the slate for the cabinet, formulated the first policies of the administration, and practically directed the foreign affairs of the United States. We had, indeed, two presidents for one. Super ambassador, he talked to emperors and kings as an equal. He was the spiritual generalissimo of the administration. He was the pilot who guided the ship. <clears throat> a secret agreement to get the U.S. into war. As the president, and also, so you see here, you have Edward House, Edward Mandel House, Colonel Edward House, who was essentially running the country, running the show. And you see President Woodrow Wilson just... We talked about him in the Skull and Bones episode. We'll refer to some of those events we referred to in the Skull and Bones episode. Again, go check that one out. Um, but you have Woodrow Wilson, supposedly the president, who is essentially just a yes man and does as he is told. And this person who is his uh, controller, for all intents and purposes, is an agent a, a, of a family lineage of agents of London international financiers. Our history is not what it is taught to us in school. As the presidential election neared for Wilson's second term, Colonel House entered into a series of confidential talks with Sir William Wiseman, who was attached to the British Embassy in Washington and who acted as a secret intermediary between House and the British Foreign Office. Charles Seymour writes, between House and Wiseman, there were soon to be few political secrets. This was upsetting to the Secretary of State, William Jennings, Bryan, Mrs. Bryan, as co-author of her husband's memoirs, writes, While Secretary Bryan was bearing the heavy responsibility of the Department of State, there arose the curious conditions surrounding Mr. E. M., that's Edward Mandel House's unofficial connection with the President and his voyages abroad on affairs of state, which were not communicated to Secretary Bryan. The President was unofficially dealing with foreign governments. What was the purpose of those dealings? It was nothing less than to work out the means whereby the United States could be brought into the war. Virick explains, Ten months before the election, which turned, returned Wilson to the White House in 1916, because he kept us out of the war, Colonel House negotiated a secret agreement with England and France on behalf of Wilson, which pledged the United States to intervene on behalf of the Allies. On March 9, 1916, Woodrow Wilson formally sanctioned the undertaking. If an inkling of the conversations between Colonel House and the leaders of England and France had reached the American people before the election, it might have caused incalculable revulsions of public opinion. Again, they hadn't sunk the Lusitania yet. From this conversation and various conferences with Sir Edward Grey grew the secret treaty made without the knowledge and consent 
of the United States Senate by which Woodrow Wilson and House chained the United States to the chariot of the Entente. That's the Allies. After the war, the text of the agreement leaked out. Gray was the first to tattle. Page discussed it at length. Colonel House tells its history. C. Hartley Grattan discusses it at length in his book, Why We Fought. But for some incomprehensible reason, the enormous significance of the revel revelation never penetrated the con consciousness of the American people, and it has been left in the dustbin of history. The basic terms of the agreement were that the United States government would offer to negotiate a peaceful settlement between Germany and the Allies and would then put forth a specific proposal for the terms of that settlement. If either side refused to accept the proposal, then the United States would come into the war as an ally of the other side. The catch was that the terms of the proposal were carefully drafted so that Germany could not possibly accept them. Thus, to the world, it would look as though Germany was at fault and the United States was humanitarian. As Am Ambassador Page observed in a memorandum dated 9 February 1916, House arrived from Berlin, Harv, Havre, I don't know how to pronounce that, maybe it's like Brett Favre, Berlin, Harv, Paris, full of the idea of American intervention. First, his plan was that he had, he and I, and a group of the British cabinet, Gray, Asquith, Lloyd, George, Reading, etc., should at once work out a minimum program of peace, the least that the Allies would accept, which he assumed would be unacceptable to the Germans, and that the President would take this program and present it to both sides. The side that declined would be responsible for continuing the war. Of course, the fatal moral weakness of the foregoing scheme is that we should plunge into the war, not on the merits of the cause, but by a carefully sprung trick. Again, these guys admit it. That's why I read these books. If you, if you find the right books, you have the right information, you'll see that they openly admit in several instances the travesty of what's truly happened to humanity throughout history. But is, is these same people still control almost all aspects of our everyday life and our perception of reality, so we don't understand this. We need to come together and stop this absolute madness on the surface it is a paradox that wilson who had always been a pacifist should now enter into a secret agreement with foreign powers to involve the united states in a war which she could easily avoid the key that unlocks this mystery is the fact that wilson also was an internationalist one of the strongest bonds between house and himself was their common dream of a world government they both recognized that the american people would never accept such a concept unless there were extenuating circumstances they reasoned that a long and bloody war was probably the only event that could condition the american mind to accept the loss of national sovereignty especially if it were packaged with the promise of putting an end to all wars in the future Wilson knew also that if the United States came into the war early enough to make a real difference on the battlefield and if large amounts of American dollars could be lent to the Allied powers, he would be in a position after the war to dictate the terms of peace. He wrote to Colonel House, England and France have not the same views with regard to peace as we have by any means. When the war is over, we can force them to our way of thinking because by the time they will, among other things, be financially in our Hand. So you see a bunch of internationalists massively controlled by international finance. We're using war. We're using manipulation of the American people and all this being constructed in secret to produce an international system of further f consolidation of financial dominance and global governance. Thankfully, this was you know, very um, early on still, and the American people hadn't been sufficiently dumbed down yet um, because they stopped the League of Nations. The League of Nations did not, was not successful. They repeat the same mechanism, as we'll see in World War II, as, well, maybe not necessarily in this book, but in World War II, the same mechanism to produce the United Nations, which we know is still around today. So the story goes that J.P. Morgan owned a bunch of shipping lines. Again, J.P. Morgan st stated in the pre previous part here, J.P. Morgan was financing um, the, the British and, and, and uh, the, fr the French armies to fight Germany in World War I. They were also doing a bunch of pur purchasing for them, so they were acting um, both sides, supplying money and supplying goods to the, the, the Allies. They also owned a bunch of shipping um, 
you know, um, boats, boating uh, ventures to transport goods between the United States and America. It turns out they also owned a ton of newspapers, tons, tons of them, so that they can control perception already back then. And I was, one of the things that was mentioned in the summary is that the German embassy produced a document warning Americans do not take a voyage on the Lusitania, or uh, not Lusitania specifically, but do not take a voyage uh, to the to England because there's a bunch of German U-boats around there and you could be sunk. Literally, the German embassy, supposedly the bad guys, German embassy in the United States was wanting to put this in newspapers, but none of the newspapers except one, which was the Des Moines Register, I think it is, yeah, the Des Moines Register, produced that document, and that's what I'm going to read here. The German embassy in Washington was well aware of the nature of the cargo being loaded aboard the Lusitania. The Lusitania, again, was filled with a bunch of uh, artifacts of war, guns, ammunition, you name it, and filed a formal complaint to the United States government because almost all of it was in direct violation of international neutrality treaties. The response was a flat denial of any knowledge of such cargo. Seeing that the Wilson administration was tacitly approving the shipment, the German embassy made one final effort to avert disaster. It placed an ad in 50 East Coast newspapers, including those in New York City, warning Americans not to take passage on the Lusitania. The ad was prepaid and requested to be placed on the paper's travel page a full week before the sailing date. It read as follows. Notice, travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies, that the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, that in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Although the ad was in the hands of newspapers, in time for the requested deadline, the State Department intervened and, raising the specter of possible libel suits, frightened the publishers into not printing it without prior clearance from the State Department attorneys. Of the 50 newspapers, only the Des Moines Register carried the ad on the requested date. So there you see, yeah, Americans' lives were lost on the Lusitania, over a thousand of them, something like that. And as a result, the impetus, the propaganda, I should say, that the American people were subjected to was essentially a false flag event. The ev so it was manipulated by Churchill on the British side, as well as the American government, the State Department intervening to make sure that we got Americans on that ship. Uh, the ship was sank, and thus you had the propaganda, the impetus for America to join the war, World War I, which greatly benefited the banking house of J.P. Morgan. Totally evil, totally scandalous. <clears throat> Next, we're going to get into some history, true history, about the Bolshevik Revolution occurring at approximately the same time area here. This, is, this chapter is called Masquerade in Moscow. The Bolshevik Revolution was not a spontaneous uprising of the masses. It was planned finance and orchestrated by outsiders. Some of the financing came from Germany, which hoped that internal problems would force Russia out of the war against her. But most of the money and leadership came from financiers in England and the United States. It was a perfect example of the Rothschild formula in action. We talked about this in the Skull and Bones episode where we get into how Avril Harriman, big time Skull and Bonesman, had massive financial um, organizations at his beck and call. They were his, um, called the Morgan Guarantee Trust. He also had Brown Brothers and Her Brown Brothers Harriman and how that side, the, the American financiers were massively propping up the Bolsheviks, certainly not so, not as much pre Bolshevik revolution, but certainly after, and it was Avril Harriman who provided a lot of the um, technological upgrades to the industry of the now the newfound Bolshevik government again that newfound government went on to slaughter 60 million of its own people folks so keep that in the back of the mind here we're going to get in the into the British side of it the what Anthony Sutton calls the group as opposed to the order in America the skull and bones you have the group in in England and here you see the group 
and the order coming together to, su- to manufacture uh, uh, the same end. This group centered mainly around a secret society created by Cecil Rhodes, one of the world's wealthiest men at the time. The purpose of that group was nothing less than world dominion and the establishment of a modern feudalist society controlled by the world's central banks. Headquartered in England, the Rhodes innermost di- directorate was called the Round Table. In other countries, there were established subordinate structures called Round Table Groups. The Round Table Group in the United States became known as the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, which was initially dominated by J.P. Morgan and later by the Rockefellers, is the most powerful group in America today. It is even more powerful than the federal government because almost all of the key positions in the government are held by its members. In other words, it is the United States government. Agents of these two groups cooperated closely in pre-revolutionary Russia, and particularly after the Tsar was overthrown. The American contingent in Russia disguised itself as a Red Cross mission, allegedly doing humanitarian work. Cashing in on their close friendship with Trotsky and Lenin, they obtained profitable business concessions from the new government, which returned their initial investment many times over. And here you can see the, this is the Red Cross mission, which we'll talk about, but it was under the guise of the charitable organization, the Red Cross, the international financiers had a couple men strategically placed that were running this mission who were actually very good friends with Trotsky and Lenin, and we're giving them millions and millions and millions of dollars to support the Bolshevik cause. And here's a telegram supporting that statement of evidence of a million dollars being transferred to these people. So, Masquerade in Moscow, the name of the chapter. Here we go, the details. And just so you know, here's the picture of that German uh, public uh, warning published in the Des Moines Register. And here's a scandalous bit of propaganda showing a woman and her baby floating to the bottom of the ocean after the Lusitania was sank. So again, totally, totally scum, total scumbaggery going on. One of the great myths of the contemporary of contemporary history is that the Bolshevik revolution in Russia was a popular uprising of the downtrodden masses against the hated ruling class of the czars. As we shall see, however, the planning, the leadership, and especially the financing came entirely from the outside, from outside Russia, mostly from financiers in Germany, Britain, and the United States. Furthermore, we shall see that the Rothschild formula played a major role in shaping these events. The amazing, this amazing story begins with the war between Russia and Japan in 1904. Jacob Schiff, who was head of the New York investment firm of Kuhn Loeb and Company, had raised the capital for large large war loans to Japan. It was due to his this funding that the Japanese were able to launch a stunning attack against the Russians at Port Arthur and the following year to virtually decimate the Russian fleet. In 1905, the Mikado awarded Jacob Schiff a medal, the second order of the treasure of Japan, in recognition of his important role in that campaign. During the two years of hostilities, thousands of Russian soldiers and sailors were taken as prisoners. Sources outside of Russia which were hostile to the Tsarist regime, paid for the printing of Marxist propaganda and had it delivered to the prison camps. Russian-speaking revolutionaries were trained in New York and sent to distribute the pamphlets among the prisoners and to indoctrinate them into rebelling against their own government. When the war was ended, these officers and enlisted men returned home to become virtual seeds of treason against the Tsar. They were to play a major role a few years later in creating mutiny among the military during the communist takeover of Russia. An important note here is, is what happened shortly after um, the successful overthrow of the Tsar when the Bolsheviks came to power is that Woodrow Wilson, and this was, we have the details of this again in that uh, Skull and Bones episode, it's called America's Secret Establishment. Again, go check that out. But Woodrow Wilson literally sent U.S. troops to keep Japan from taking over Siberia and all this massive unoccupied land that the Japanese could easily have taken over. So you see Jacob Schiff in this instance is playing both sides here. He's supporting the Japanese against Russia. And then, oh, we got to stop the Japanese from, from taking over Russia because we have our newfound um, revolutionists now in power 
we need to use the, some military to stop the Japanese. So let's send the American troops there, which Woodrow Wilson, again, as just a total puppet whore, yes man, went along with this. And in that episode, we have evidence of uh, the Russians, again, the, in the newfound communist Bolshevik government, praising the American troops at that time. Let me see my next notes here. <clears throat> The next piece of the story here. The head of the British Secret Service in America at the time was Sir William Wiseman, who, as fate would have it, occupied the apartment directly above the apartment of Edward Mandel House and who had become fast friends with him. House advised Wiseman that President, President Wilson wished to have Trotsky released. So, pause here. Trotsky was educated by Jacob Schiff. Um, there's a definitely a Jewish influence here. Um, Because Trotsky was Jewish, and Jacob Schiff, big Jewish banking financier, educated Trotsky um, and sent him into um, Russia, the USSR, to support massively with money and the intellectual impetus for revolution against the Tsar. Okay, Trotsky was arrested in Canada and had tons of money on him, and so. That's what's happening here. House advised Wiseman that President Wilson, Wilson wished to have Trotsky released. Wiseman advised his government and the British Admiralty issued orders on April 21st that Trotsky was to be sent on his way. It was a fateful decision that would affect not only the outcome of war, but the future of the entire world indeed, because if the Bolshevik Revolution wasn't successful, you wouldn't have had the communist um, reign of terror in the USSR, and a lot more people would still be alive today. A totally different world. It would be a mistake to conclude that Jacob Schiff and Germany were the only players in this drama. Trotsky could not have gone even as far as Halifax without have, having been granted an American passport. And this was accomplished by the personal intervention of, the, of President Wilson. Professor Anthony Sutton says, President Woodrow Wilson was the fairy godmother who pr provided Trotsky with a passport to return to Russia to carry forward the revolution. At the same time, careful State Department bureaucrats concerned about such revolutionaries entering Russia were unilaterally attempting to tighten up passport procedures. And there were others as well. In 1911, the St. Louis Dispatch published a cartoon by a Bolshevik named Robert Miner. It's the one I showed you earlier. Miner was later to be arrested in Tsarist Russia for revolutionary activities and, in fact, was himself bankrolled by famous Wall Street financiers. Since we may safely assume that he knew his topic well, his cartoon is of great historical importance. It portrays Karl Marx with a book entitled Socialism under his arm, standing amid a cheering crowd on Wall Street, gathered around and greeting him with enthusiastic hand handshakes, our characters in silk hats identified as John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, John D. Ryan of National City Bank, Morgan partner George W. Perkins, and Teddy Roosevelt, leader of the Progressive Party. What emerges from this sampling of events is a clear pattern of support for Bolshevism coming from the highest financial and political power centers in the United States, from men who supposedly were capitalists and who, according to conventional wisdom, should have been the mortal enemies of socialism and communism. Nor was this phenomenon confined to the United States. Trotsky, in his book, My Life, tells of a British financier who, in 1907, gave him a large loan to repay after the overthrow of the Tsar. Again, that's 10 years before the actual final overthrow happened. 10 years before this, this was planned by, British, by financiers across the globe, international financiers. Arsene Degolovich, who witnessed the Bolshevik Revolution firsthand, has identified both the name of the financier and the amount of the loan. In private interviews, he said, I have been told that over 21 million rubles were spent by Lord Alfred Milner in financing the Russian Revolution. The financier just mentioned was by no means alone among the British to support the Russian Revolution with large financial donations. And Lord Alfred Milner, we're about to talk to more, but certainly not a Jewish financier. So there's multiple um, you know, ethnicities, if you will, involved in this, um, but there is certainly a large Jewish contingent, and that's a very important thing to keep in the back of your mind. Another name specifically mentioned by Degolovich was that of Sir George Buchanan, the British ambassador to Russia at the time. Next note, it's page 270. Here we go. We'll get a little bit more about who Milner is and Cecil Rhodes, Ruskin, Rhodes, and Milner. In 1870, 
A wealthy British socialist by the name of John Ruskin was appointed as professor of fine arts at Oxford University in London. He taught that the state must take control of the means of production and organize them for the good of the community as a whole. He advocated placing control of the state into the hands of a small ruling class, perhaps even a single dictator. He said, my continual aim has been to show the eternal superiority of some men to others, sometimes even of one man to all others. This, of course, is the same intellectual appeal of communism. Lenin taught that the masses could not be trusted to handle their own affairs and that a special group of disciplined intellectuals must assume this role for them. That is the function of the Communist Party, which never comprises more than about 3% of the population. Even when the charade of free elections is allowed, only members of the party or those over whom the KGB has total control are permitted to run for office. And I believe no one is allowed to run for office now without the approval of the party, such as they are. Ruskin's message had a sensational impact. His inaugural lecture was copied out in longhand by one undergraduate, Cecil Rhodes, who kept it with him for 30 years. Cecil Rhodes was one of the world's, made one of the world's greatest fortunes. With the cooperation of the Bank of England and financiers like Rothschild, he was able to establish a virtual monopoly over the diamond output of South Africa and most of the country's gold as well. The major portion of this vast income was spent to advance the ruling class ideas of John Ruskin. Dr. Carol Quigley explains, the Rhodes scholarships established by the terms of the Cecil Rhodes seventh will are known to everyone. What is not so widely known is that Rhodes in five previous wills left his fortune to form a secret society, which was to devote, its, devote itself to the preservation and expansion of the British empire. And what does not seem to be known to anyone is that this secret society was created by Rhodes and his principal trustee, Lord Milner, and continues to exist to this day. In his books on Rhodes' will, he, he Steed, who was a member of the inner circle, wrote in one place, Mr. Rhodes was more than the founder of a dynasty. He aspired to be the creator of one of those, those vast semi-religious quasi-political associations, which, like the Society of Jesus, that's the Jesuits, have played so large a part in the history of the world. To be more strictly accurate, he wished to found an order as the instrument of the will of the dynasty. In this secret society, Rhodes was to be leader, Stead, Brett, Lord Escher, and Milner were to form an executive committee. Arthur, Lord Balfour, Sir Harry Johnston, Lord Rothschild, Albert, Lord Grey, and others were listed as potential members of a circle of initiates, while there was to be an outer circle known as the Association of Helpers, later organized by Milner as the Round Table Organization. The pattern of conspiracy. And we kind of talked about, again, this stuff in the... Um, the uh, Skull and Bones episode, excuse me. So I won't go into too much detail here, except to say that there is evidence now of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. This, this Milner Roundtable, it's not evidence, this is what happened. The Royal Institute of International Affairs is what the, is the offshoot of, this, of Milner's Roundtable groups just like the Council of Foreign Relations. The Council of Foreign Relations is the American branch of the, branch of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Within the CFR and the RIIA, however, you have a smaller circle of influence, which is what was just referred to there as, as Milner's Kindergarten, this, this small little circle of very highly influential people. Anthony Sutton in the America's Secret Establishment on the Skull and Bones tells the same thing about the CFR, how within the CFR you, you have, and the CFR is really not a conspiracy either because it's a, it does everything essentially in the open. It should be more open, I would, I would argue, but within the CFR you have a small cadre of highly influential people. A lot of them have been skull and bones men that actually move the, the CFR in the direction that they desire. <clears throat> and so Important point here is that there are round table, well, that's a lot of important points, but the next point is that there are round table agents in Russia. In Russia, prior to and during the revolution, there were many local observers, tourists, and newsmen who reported that British and American agents were everywhere, particularly in Petrograd, provide, providing money for insurrection. One report said, for example, that British agents were seen handing out 25 ruble notes to the men at 
Pavlovsky's regiment just a few hours before it mutinied against its officers and sided with the revolution. The subsequent publication of various memoirs and documents made it clear that this funding was provided by Milner and channeled through Sir George Buchanan, who was the ambassador to Russia at that time, the British ambassador to Russia at the time. It was a repeat of the ploy that had worked so well for the cabal many times in the past. Roundtable members were once again working both sides of the conflict to weaken and topple a target government. Tsar Nicholas had every reason to believe that since the British were Russia's allies in the war against Germany, British, British officials, officials would be the last persons on earth to conspire against him. Yet the British ambassador himself represented the hidden group which was financing the regime's downfall. One last piece. And this is, I mean, this is such a fascinating um, history here that there's so much in this book too. And it's really, it was really tough to select which fragments of this to read because it's all important and very enlightening. So again, I highly recommend that you go out, buy this book, read it and come to your own conclusions. I think you'll find that mine are reasonable conclusions that I'm drawing from this, but maybe you disagree. And I'd, if you do, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Daniel at realcovidfacts.org. You can find me there. So, British agents of the Round Table. After the Bolsheviks had seized power in Russia, Sir George Buchanan was recalled as the British ambassador and replaced by a member of Brid Milner's Kindergarten, a young man by the name of Bruce Lockhart. In his book, British Agent, Lockhart describes the circumstances of his assignment. Speaking of a meeting with Prime Minister Lord George, George he wrote, I saw that his own mind was made up. He had been greatly impressed, as Lord Milner told me afterwards by an interview with Colonel Thompson of the American Red Cross. It's one of these American Red Cross figures we're going to get into. There's Thompson and Robin, who had just returned from Russia and who had denounced in blunt language the folly of the Allies in not opening up negotiations with the Bolsheviks. Three days later, all my doubts were put at rest. I was to go to Russia as a head of a special mission to establish unofficial relations with, with the Bolsheviks. I had been selected for this Russian mission, not by the foreign secretary, but by the war cabinet, actually by Lord Milner and by Mr. Lloyd George. Lord Milner I saw almost daily. Five days before my departure, I dined alone with him at Brooks. He was in his most inspiring mood. He talked to me with a charming frankness about the war, about the future of England, about his own career, and about the opportunities of youth. He was, too, very far from being the jingo and the conservative reactionary whom popular opinion at one time represented him to be. On the contrary, many of his views on society were startling, startling modern. He believed in the highly organized state in which service, efficiency, and hard work were more important than titles or money bags. Of course, his own money bags would be not only protected, but fattened, which is why he was for this. American agent of the round table. When Thompson returned to the United States, the man he selected to replace himself as head of the American Red Cross mission was his second in command, Raymond Robbins. Not much is known about Robbins except that he was the protege of Colonel Edward Mandel House, who we just talked about. And he might have remained an obscure player in this drama had it not been for the fact that he became one of the central characters in Bruce Lockhart's book. It is there that we get this inside view. Another new acquaintance of these first days in the Bolshevized St. Petersburg was Raymond Robbins, the head of the American Red Cross mission. He had been a leading figure in Roosevelt's Bull Moose campaign for the American presidency in 1912. Although a rich man himself, he was an, he was an anti-capitalist. Hitherto, his two heroes had been Roosevelt and Cecil Rhodes. Now Lenin had captured his imagination. Robbins was the only man whom Lenin was always willing to see and who ever succeeded in imposing his own personality on the unemotional Bolshevik leader. So Lenin, head of the Bolsheviks, slaughterer of many, Robbins, this American who was the head of this Red Cross mission, which was a front for laundering money to get to the Bolsheviks, Robin had sway over Lenin. We'll see more about that in the next page here. In a less official sense, Robbins had a similar mission to my own. This is Lockhart speaking. He was the intermediary between the Bolsheviks and the American government and had set himself the task of persuading President Wilson to recognize the Soviet regime. What an amazing revelation is contained, what an amazing, yeah, is contained in these, these words. First, we learn that Robbins was a leader in the team effort that through the election of 1912 to Woodrow Wilson. Then we learn that he was an anti-capitalist. Third, we discover that an anti-capitalist can 
hero worship Cecil Rhodes, then we see the tremendous power he wielded over Lenin, and finally we are told that, although he was part of a private group financed by Wall Street bankers, he was, in reality, the intermediary between the Bolsheviks and the American government. One will look in vain for a better summary. The fact that Cecil Rhodes was one of Robin's great heroes has special significance for this story. It was not only merely an intellectual infatuation from college days. On the night before he left Russia, Robbins dined with Lockhart. Describing the occasion, Lockhart says, He had been reading Rhodes' life, and after dinner he gave us a wonderful exposition of Rhodes' character. Thus, both Lockhart and Robbins were dedicated disciples of Cecil Rhodes, and both were undoubtedly part of the international network to which Professor Quigley alluded, possibly even members of the round table. Lockhart reported to the British group, while Robbins reported to the American group, but both were clearly working for identical objectives and doing the work of the unseen hand. You know, I find it interesting that, because I believe the book that the um, America's Secret Establishment, the introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones by Anthony Sutton, was written before this. I'm pretty sure it was. I think that book was like 1983. This is 1994. In this book, we, as we've read earlier in this episode here, G. Edward Griffin actually cites some of Anthony Sutton's other work as evidence, which it certainly is, but he missed Anthony Sutton's, what Anthony Sutton calls his magnum opus in the America's Secret Establishment. So it would have been very interesting if, if G. Edward Griffin had read that book and how this book would have changed as a result. But even here, he, see, he says there's evidence of this group in America, this group in Britain, working together to establish the USSR, as well as obviously supporting the allies in World War I and World War II. Very interesting. The Bolsheviks were well aware of the power these men represented, and there was no door closed to them. They were allowed to attend meetings of the Central Executive Committee and were consulted regarding important decisions. But perhaps the best way to appraise the extent of the influence these capitalists had over the anti-capitalists is to let Lockhart tell his own story. In his memoirs, he wrote... I returned from our interview to our flat to find an urgent message from Robbins requesting me to come to see him at once. I found him in a state of great agitation. He had been in conflict with Salkind, a nephew of Trotsky, and then assistant commissioner for foreign affairs. Salkind had been rude, and the American, who had a promise from Lenin that whatever happened, a train would always be ready for him at an hour's notice, was determined to exact, to exact an apology or to leave the country. When I arrived, he had just finished telephoning to Lenin. He had delivered his ultimatum, and Lenin had promised to give a reply within 10 minutes. I waited while Robbins fumed. Then the telephone rang, and Robbins picked up the receiver. Lenin had capitulated. Salkin was dismissed from his post, but he was an old member of the party. Would Robbins have any objection if Lenin sent him a Bolshevik emissary to burn? Robbins smiled grimly. Thank you, Mr. Lenin, he said, as I can't send the son of a bitch to hell to burn is the next best thing you can do with him. Such was the raw power over the leaders of communism that was concealed behind the innocent facade of the American Red Cross mission. And yet, the world, even today, has no inkling of its reality. It has been a carefully guarded secret, and even many of those who were close to it were unable to see it. The assistant to William Thompson in Russia was Cornelius Keller. In later years, reflecting on the naivete of Dr. Franklin Billings, who was head of the mission's medical team, Kellner wrote, Poor Mr. Billings believed he was in charge of a scientific mission for the relief of Russia. He was, in reality, nothing but a mask. The Red, Co Red Cross complexion of this mission was nothing but a mask. So you see, again, massive, massive monetary influence from secret organization using a little less secret organizations, then using the government to fully support a total communist regime which committed massive atrocities against humanity. Thus, these people are complicit and the cause of these massive atrocities against humanity. We here in America are have the benefit of having the atrocities being more of the mind control state instead of the let's just kill you state. So we should at least thank our lucky stars that we have that. And certainly these guys don't have total control. Otherwise, you and I would not be having this conversation right now. Um, so let's 
close up this episode with this final little summary, and we're not going to get into any details in this chapter. Um, this chapter was called The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, which is actually a shout out to an Anthony Sutton book because the enemy that they're talking about is the USSR, and it is totally bought and paid for. The Bolshevik Re Revolution was a coup d'etat in which a radical minority captured the Russian government from the moderate revolutionary majority. The Red Cross mission of New York financiers threw support to Bolsheviks and in return received economic rewards in the form of rights to Russia's natural resources, plus contracts for construction and supplies. The continued participation in the economic development of Russia and Eastern Europe since that time indicates that this relationship has survived to the present day. These financiers are not pro-communist. Their motivation is profit and power. They are now working to bring bro both Russia and the United States into a world government which they expect to control. War and threats of war are tools to prod the masses toward the acceptance of that goal. Oops, sorry, I lost my spot there. Uh. It is essential, therefore, that the United States and the industrialized nations of the world have credible enemies. As these words are being written, Russia is wearing the mask of peace and cooperation. But we have seen that before. We may yet see a return of the evil empire when the timing is right. U.S. government and megabank funding, first of Russian and now of Chinese and Middle East military capabilities, cannot be understood without this insight. Indeed, it cannot. Again, I've repeated it ad nauseum because it is fundamental to our current state of political world affairs. China, Russia have formed what's called the BRICS nations. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. I mean, I think just today I heard that Malaysia and Singapore have joined this organization, this um, um, group of nations, which are a threat to, ostensibly a threat. Again, this none of this would be threatening if this financial system we're talking about here didn't exist. It's a manufactured uh, appearance of they are, they are our enemies, but they're growing stronger. They're getting off the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is going to go bye-bye. They're ushering in a new financial style system, the same people that control the old financial system will, will absolutely be in control of the new one. They might need a third world war after the big whammy of COVID-19, which utterly decimated the old financial system and is the cause, the source of our current inflation problems because, well, it's not the source of it. It's the excuse used for the massive printing of the U.S. dollars into oblivion, which though the... Federal Reserve just increased interest rates as you know, you know to, to shrink loans and to shrink easy money. I believe that that will be reversed within a few months time here and we'll be back to the old inflationary, massive inflationary mechanism. So yeah, this is, you can't understand what's happening now if you don't understand this. I think you'll agree. I think you'll agree that what most people are taught to believe is whatever the hive mind behind the television tells them to believe, which is that there are these ind independent communist party who rose of its own, you know, personal independent history has nothing to do with international financing. And they're just going to be friends with Russia for some mutually beneficial things. And again, no fi international financial powers that be are behind that. That's not the case, obviously, as we know that certainly not the case in the Middle East as well. So that's where I was going to leave. I'm going to leave you today. I actually had planned to go much farther into this book today, but we didn't get there. So it looks like this book will actually be four episodes. There is even some more, I think is perhaps more fascinating history coming up uh, when we get through the history of the reserve banks of the United States, because actually the Federal Reserve now is actually the fourth reserve bank that the United States has had. But we're also going to get into fascinating history about the Civil War. So I will leave you there. Thank you all for listening. God bless you all. I hope you learned you know, a large amount of information from this. I suspect that mo most of you that stuck through to the end here kind of already knew this information or at least suspected that this information was uh, real. And so hopefully it fulfilled your, your expectation. Please consider 
you know, if you, if you do find value in what we're doing here, I know times are tough, but please consider donating to Grand Forks Best Source for putting, for being a beacon of truth here in an age of absolute lies and deception. You can donate to Grand Forks Best Source at gfbestsource.com and click on the donate tab and it's pretty self-explanatory from there. Um, again, I love you all. Thank you. I will see you next time for part three of The Creature from Jekyll.